Welcome, good morning. Good morning to this talk. Um, in this talk, I'm with the title, Let's Stay Close, and I think the, the meaning of that title will get clear along the way. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the relationship between the stadium, a hamburger, and OpenMP. And um, whenever, yeah, when you're interested, feel, feel free to take a seat. So, one thing that I like to do is look at the big picture. And um, that, can, that can be an eye-opener. For example, here, for those of you that were not at the BOF yesterday, what is this? This is a plastic soccer goal with the ball, you might think. And it is, but when you see it in perspective, you see something very different. And that's exactly uh, what I want to do. I want to look at the big picture of a fairly complex topic, thread affinity support in OpenMP. That's what we're going to talk about. But it'll be interleaved with some lightweight slides, and, but I'll also convey information, I hope. So here's the summary, and then I'll go into the details. And I know people will stop by, and I hope, I hope they'll, it's exciting enough for them to stay, but here's the summary. Here's a stadium, and in a stadium, we have places. And in terms of OpenMP, that's where threads can execute. And that's called a place. And that's a very, very important word to remember in this context. It's called a place. A place, yeah, please take a seat. Uh, a place is um, where a thread can potentially execute. Okay. Then, let me see. Uh, something. Uh, okay. Then we have some sort of attraction in that same stadium, like the food place where we would like to be. And that's the hamburger place and what people often like to do is they'll because the food the food will be there you got to go to the food and that's actually what you want to do with the affinity and the metaphors of course you got your data and the threads will move to that data so it's not the data moving it's the threads moving to where they uh, where they are to be that's what you control through the affinity policy so the two things you you have to think about the places you have and where you want to have things being executed. Okay. Why do we worry about this? Why is this such an issue? Well, let me show you a, a very simple template CC NUMA architecture. I show a two socket system here and we got two processors or cores or sockets or whatever, two things that ex can execute. And nowadays, even, even small two socket systems have this kind of architecture. And that's being done for scalable memory performance. And that's called CC NUMA, cache coherent, non-uniform memory access. And the reason it's non-uniform is that the memory is scattered over the system. So each processor talks to a portion of the memory, but thanks to a smart cache coherent interconnect, you will see all of that memory. You don't even know it's physically distributed. You better know about it. <laughs> But it's hidden, it's kind of transparent. So to you, this appears as one machine with a bunch of cores and some memory. Okay. The question is how to distribute the data. So let's say the data is here. Well, when I'm running here in this processor, it's fine. I have the fastest data access possible. It's not so fine when I'm running over there and I got to get my data. That will slow me down. And think about a parallel program. Maybe a few threads are running here. They'll get the data very quickly. And some other threads are running there. And you all end up waiting in that barrier for those threads to be finished. So that's not a good situation. It's key to remember that ultimately the operating system de decides on where to place data. It's in charge of that. What we can do is tell it what we would like to do. Okay. And there were several solutions available before it, it got into OpenMP 4.0, but they were all system specific. Okay? So there are solutions today, even if you don't have OpenMP 4.0, the beauty now is that you have a more standard way of expressing that affinity. Okay. So what all, pretty much all operating systems that I know about do is they allocate their data according to what is called first touch. So how, what does that mean? Well, here's a little loop. That loop initializes a vector to zero. It's a very, very simple operation. Don't, don't get confused by the 100. That's just to make the diagram a little easier. 
but you have a loop and you initialize data to zero. A question to you could be, where will the data go? Well, that depends on the policy the OS has. And the first touch policy says the one who touches the data for the first time will own it. So if I don't do anything, somebody will execute this loop and will own the data from their own. Okay. So what will happen is from there, you know, this processor may own all the data. That may or may not be what I want. Okay. But that's first touch. Okay. So they all end up in whoever is uh, touch. And when I say touch, it's technically it's defined as the thread setting up the TLB entry, the address mapping for the first time. Okay, that's first touch. Okay. There's a very easy solution to this simple problem here. In this case, I would like to run this on two threads because then both will initialize half of the array and likewise, they'll have half of the data. Whether that's of benefit further on, that's of course up to me to decide upon, but that's what is called first touch. And this is how you take, use it to your advantage. Now I got my data scattered. And the way you use it, you look at your algorithm. How does it access the data? And then you go back to the drawing board. Can I massage that first part, that initialization part, so that it ends up where I'll need it later on? Okay. That's kind of you know, cumbersome. And if it works, it's fine. But again, now with the affinity, we have a much better way to control this kind of stuff. Okay. So here's a template, you know, multi-core architecture that's very common these days. Pretty much everybody has it. Of course, the devil is in the details, but at, at a sufficiently high level, uh, we see a bunch of cores. The cores support one or more hardware threads. And there's a fairly complex memory here okay, behind it. I all collapse that into memory, but there's caches, and there's level one, level two, shared caches, private caches. But ultimately, there's some portion of memory to store your data, and that's confined to sockets. Okay. And then there is a global interconnect that glues it all together to one. So you, you need element A from your data, the system will find it for you. And as I said several times already, you'd rather have it close to where you need it. So, to get good scalable performance, it's absolutely critical that threads are there where the data is. And as I said in the beginning, the philosophy is the data is where it is and you move to your data. Because that's cheaper, way cheaper. And easier in a way. So what are the benefits? The, the big benefit is you don't no longer have all these remote references to your data elsewhere and especially on larger machines, more than two sockets, that really starts to play a role. Okay. You maximize the bandwidth because now they're all reading at the same time from their memories. So you get parallelism at the bandwidth level instead of all maximizing out the, the bandwidth of one socket or just a few. You reduce the latency because you're closer to your data. And um, yeah, those are the two main benefits, I would say. Now again, the philosophy is data is wherever it may be. We're not going to move data and threads move to where they need the data. And that brings me to the two key concepts in the affinity control, the place list. And I showed you some kind of funny examples of places, um, but we'll get more serious in a minute. And on top of that, there's the affinity policy that dictates where things should go. Where should they execute? So keep in mind, it's a two-step kind of process. So you've got your place list. And one way is a place consists of a set of numbers. And those numbers correspond to what the hardware has. So you need to know, you need to have some way of telling, OK, that's thread 0, that's hardware thread 4, and that's on this core. So that's what you need to know if you want to use these numbers. That's, that's just the way it is. I call that a scheduling unit. A number means that's something that can run my thread. It doesn't have to be a hardware thread. It could be, basically could be anything. It's, it's some sort of execution vehicle. And um, that's, um, that's a place. And again, that's where, take a seat, please. That's, all right, okay. And uh, just as a reminder that 
two books available for the most active participant. So far you have not been very active, so there's still opportunity. <laughs> so again, scheduling unit where a thread can run. Excuse me, I, I do need a bit of water. And that could be a hardware thread, could be something else. Now a single place could consist of a single number. That's a single element place. Or that's usually not a good situation because it means the OS has no freedom. It's generally better to have a place with multiple elements so the OS can choose. Have given them more freedom. If the hardware allows for that, better take advantage of it. Because it's a you know, time-shared you know, multi-user OS, so the OS is running, maybe something else. So give it more freedom if you can. So that's up to you to put that into the place list. So let's, let's get more specific. Let's look at an example. Um, I'm talking here about an imaginary system with two sockets, uh, two cores per socket. So in total, we have four cores. And each core has four threads, so we're talking about a 16-threaded system. You know, a fairly you know, standard configuration. And here's the lower-level picture. And let me show you here the numbers. And on your OS, there should be commands, ways to find out what these numbers are. That's where the machine dependency comes into the picture. So you got to know, like, okay, hardware thread 5 is actually on socket 0 and core 1. Yeah. Okay. And there are ways to do that. Sorry? Uh, that's the proc CPU info will tell you, and there's NUMA control. Okay. Oh, the question is how you find out on Linux? Yeah. Yeah, slash proc is your friend. That's where you find a lot of information. All right. Okay. So, for example, I could define a place, and remember this is one place, consists of four elements. 0, 1, 2, 3, and that means that I'm looking at this core. So here I'm describing to the system that this place is, consists of the four threads connected to that core. Okay. And you get all the freedom you have. You do whatever you like. You can come up with very bizarre configurations. You can come up with something that makes more sense. It's up to you. Okay. So you've got a place. Okay. And I suggest that, in this case, that defines all the threads in socket 0, core 0. And as you can imagine, these lists get very long. So there's a very convenient interval notation. In this case, 0, colon, 4, 0, 1. Um, you got to know that this is the starting number. The tricky part is a little bit, this is the, the count, not the last element. So I want to have four numbers starting with 0 and an increment of 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, okay? So that's how I, in a way, and I, I can tell you, you'll be using this all the time, you know, because these lists get really long, okay? So, key to remember, the numbers within the place, they don't matter. That's the freedom, again, you give to the scheduler, pick one, and it can hopefully take advantage of that. It should take advantage of that. So, in terms of a place, 0, 1, 2, 3 is the same as 3, 2, 1, 0. Doesn't matter. Okay. And the idea is, of course, that that's like at that level, it doesn't matter for performance which one you select. Okay. Now, the place list, as you can imagine, consists of a list of places. Okay. So this is a place list consisting of two places. And each place, in this case, has four elements. Now, here the order does matter. So, I need to stress that. So, and there's a very good reason why the order matters. Because the policy that I'm going to apply is, is applicable at the level of places. And I want to talk about things like spread and close. Well, what does close mean? That means that the order starts to matter. So, keep that in mind. There the order matters. Okay. So, this place list is different, okay? I reversed the two places. Not a big deal, I just need to emphasize that. So, and you set that in OpenMP through OMP underscore places. That's an environment variable that defines your places, 
okay? So you use the shell syntax that you, you, know, you like, and you set this one, in this case, to this. So I, now I have two places, again, each consisting of four elements. Okay. And again, the, the interval notation applies to this as well. So I can do this. Okay. Actually, I could go a little bit further, but it gets a little bit mind-boggling uh, there. So, so I got, again, I see some puzzled faces, syntax. Starting number zero, count, so zero, one, two, three, four. Next one, eight, nine, 10, 11, because again, this is the count with the stride, the increment, okay? That's why I stressed that earlier on. That's like, okay, don't make a mistake there. You'll have a different place list than you think you have. It may work, but not the way um, they're doing that. Now, I like this as much as I like it. There's a more convenient way. Yeah. They're called abstract names. So you can just say, my places are all the sockets in the system, or all the cores, you know, lower granularity, or all the threads in the system. So you don't have to worry about numbers. It's more portable, definitely more portable. And um, all you do is you say OMP places equals cores, and this, the, the system will figure it out for you. You could even say, well, but I only want you to use four cores. That gives a certain freedom that you may or may not like. Okay? Uh, if you want to have full control, use the numbers. If you're okay, well, pick some, some cores. Um, that's fine. The system dependent. System dependent. There's an environment variable, which I now have to cite. <laughs> OMP underscore display underscore ENV environment. That'll show you. Yep. Strongly recommended to use. <laughs> okay. All right. And um, an implementation is free to add names to it. These have to be supported. If you're compliant with 4.0, these have to be supported. If you feel like this doesn't cover my hardware all the way, you can add names to it. But of course, from that moment on, you lose portability. Fine. I think that's a very acceptable thing. So let's take an example. I set OMP places equals cores. In my imaginary architecture, that's the same as this. Again, or the interval notation. Okay, well, pick whatever you like. And of course, in this case, you would definitely go to, to use cores. You know, why, why make it harder than, um, than it is? All right. And um, the mind boggling thing is you can apply the interval notations at the place level. So I can repeat places. Uh, I know I'm already running out of time, which I conveniently ignore. I just hope we have enough disk space in the camera. Um, so this is the same thing. Now this one is repeated. This means four places, and each value is incremented by four. You know, you probably have to look at it once or maybe twice or three times to realize it's the same, but it is the same. So it's a very compact notation. Okay. So now we have defined the places. This tells the system where we can execute our threads. Time to tell it how to distribute the threads over the system. That's the affinity policy. And here I'm back again with my uh, stadium. So we have maybe zero, that's the field place. There could be some cheap place. There could be a balcony place. There could be an illegal place on the roof. And of course, there's our hamburger place. And what we want to do is we want to map the threads onto whatever we want okay that's your next choice to make okay so the affinity policy tells the system out of all these places what to use and how okay so i just said and you do that in a symbolic way there are three keywords master close or spread and by the way i'm not sure this is on the slides this applies to every parallel region so on a per i should say per parallel region basis so you say at this level i want you to use this policy and maybe the next level a different policy so it works very well with nested parallelism for example i i didn't put that on slides but i definitely should have have done so again each parallel region has that policy um okay so i'll stick with like one level here but again you can nest these things and and binding is implied. What does binding mean? That means the thread won't move. 
once it has been assigned to, ultimately it will go on to one of those low-level numbers for you, and it will stay there or for the duration of that parallel region. And that makes sense because it means you stay close to your data, you don't move away after all. Okay. That's the run, oh, the question is how do you guarantee that? That's the runtime system doing that for you. Okay, so you don't have to worry. I know there's like a low level APIs for binding, that's done for you. Okay. You see the OS just like right. The common here is that the OS, um, some OS's or most OS's are fairly liberal because they think they know better than you do. Uh, here we take control and the runtime system will do that for us, which is really nice. I really like that. Yeah. So the binding is implied. So some policies. This is the master policy. And we've got the master thread and we all want to be very close to that master thread. All right. That's one policy. Then there's the close policy where we all want to be nice and cozy, very close to the master thread. Oh, sorry. We want to be nice and cozy all to that master thread somewhere there. And there's the spread policy where we all want to be kind of spread out relative to the master thread. Okay. And that, of course, has pros and cons. It depends on your application. And keep in mind, you do this on a per parallel region basis. So you can really tailor it to whatever you're doing there. And it can, so it, it'll change, it can, you can change it, like, okay, in this part of my computation, I want to have it like this, and here I want it like that. that, that's fine, that'll work. The one thing that doesn't change is your place list. The place list is set once and for all, okay. But the policy is adapted. All right, so you do that through another environment variable, proc underscore bind, and here's an example. I want to have the first level threads to be spread out, and then the second level, if any, will be close. Okay. You, if you like, you can do this. So this is for all parallel regions. As with every environment variable, it's kind of globally applicable. You can do it on a per parallel region basis by using the proc bind clause and mix and match. Okay. Um, so the place list defines what's available to wrap it up uh, for the duration of the program. The affinity policy defines where threads go. Okay, and let me finish with one example and then I'm really done. Um, so I'll say in my imaginary uh, two socket system course, that will under the hood create a place list for me. I'll tell the threads to be spread out and I'm going to use four threads. Okay. Now, in the specifications, it's well defined what that means in terms of what places are generated and whatever. But what it boils down to is one open MP thread per place. No surprise, I have four threads. I want to spread them out and I have four cores in my system. So this is again my system and this is how they're going to run. So I got one here, place, another place, my four places. And the threads, let me see, I hope they'll pop up. They will run. Uh, okay. And I'll say that one more time. The choice, this is a totally arbitrary choice. Shouldn't matter. And um, that was the talk. Any more questions? I know I'm running awfully late. I'm sorry for keeping you longer than we promised. I'm not even sure we promised something. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Scatter is, is an extension then, but it may be an old one. Oh, sorry. So the, the, the question is, the Xeon Phi says scatter. I think scatter may be implemented before OpenMP 4.0 was out. I would use spread because that gives me portability across other platforms. I assume their scatter is the same as the spread in 4.0, but you have to check the documentation. My guess is that was invented before 4.0 came out. And I think it may even be an early name for spread. Maybe. I don't know. Dirk will know in the audience, but he's very quiet. Dirk actually here in the audience, he's one of the guys behind it. He's keeping me very honest. So, <laughs> okay. So again, sorry for running late. Yeah. At the beginning, you know, yeah. Right, right, right. All this work sort of hinges on you already having the data in the proper place, correct? 
Well, or you move, okay, so the, the question is, this hinges on the fact that your data is in the proper place, or you, you, you play with the policies to move them there, okay? Like, I want you to all to run in that socket, because I know that's where my data is, or close to the core. Okay. How do you know where the data is? OpenMP doesn't have an API for that. Actually, I just think maybe we should. Uh, on our operating system, Solaris, there's an API to tell you, okay? But you have to code it in. So, yeah, that's, you touch upon a good point. Uh, how do you know? Actually, uh, you also, you, ultimately, um, you may not be able to easily tell where your feds are running. You hope for the best. There are ways to find out. Talk with me offline and I can tell you. Yeah. All right. No more questions. We have a lucky draw and I'll, I promise to give a book to the most active, active participants and you ask a bunch of questions and I know you have a copy of you ask a bunch of questions. I think you have the book already. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Make some money out of this. <laughs> have a lucky draw. Yeah, I think you can write your name on, on, on something or...